everyone. Welcome to the latest issue of China Success, a podcast designed to showcase success stories in China, particularly here in Australia. And today I'm delighted to have as my guest Jeremy Oliver, a well-known uh, wine expert in Australia who has particularly carved out a niche for himself as an expert in terms of Australian wine and China. And so it's really great to have you on the show, Jeremy. Thank you for being here. Absolute pleasure, David. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. And now today I want to talk about one of Australia's major export success stories, which is the wine industry. And there's no one better than you to give us some background in terms of how did Australian wine become such a great export story? And in particular, how did it get started in China, which led to such great success? Yeah, I think um, it got started in China because a few companies and uh, Treasury Wine Estates, um, the owner of uh, the Penfolds brand, was there in the early days. I remember uh, working with Wine Australia back in um, you know early 2000s, heading over to China just with a few dollars, and we were hosting big events. Um, but these brands like Penfolds were already established. Um, their distributor at the time uh, was ASC Fine Wines, which was by daylight um, the largest, most professional, uh, most complete operation of wine distribution in the United States, um, owned by a, a family who made their money out of uh, selling cars, but they went about the introduction of wine into the Chinese culture uh, with great intelligence. Um, they initially uh, worked on education, uh, so they were, they were very, very keen on educating the market. Um, they spent a fortune on that. They employed a huge number of people from all over the world um, because at that time, uh, the Chinese didn't take Chinese wine people seriously. It's all changed now, um, of course. Uh, and you'd go along, you'd go to the ASC offices, you'd hear every accent out of you know, European wine producing countries. They're all there promoting wines from that country, hosting events. Um, ASC also understood that component in the early days in China, it was very important that, uh, you know, uh, if you were drinking wine in China, you were over 40 years old, you were drinking Bordeaux. And ASC had a huge Bordeaux folio. And the brand that was able to break into that space um, for a number of reasons was actually Penfolds. It was the first one to break into that space. And you could argue that for a few years, until I think they actually lost control of that brand story in China. They were, um, you know, the most credible wine presence for quite a, a few years in China. And that was because, um, and especially under the, the, uh, that period, or during that period of time when David Deary was CEO of Treasury Wine Estates, David understood the importance of the big event, the big gesture, launching limited wines that the whole world wanted in Shanghai at $1,800 Australian per bottle, limited release penfolds, um, creating, um, you know, such media stories as the ampule of Grange. Or, so it wasn't Grange, it was a special bin number, I beg your pardon, but a, a super expensive, like 15,000 US um, crystal ampule in which um, a wine was put. Um, only a dozen or so of these were made, but it was front page on just about every newspaper in the world for two days. Such an amazing gesture, clearly targeted and aimed at the China market. Uh, so Deary had his finger right on this pulse. He knew that the aspirational nature of the market, he understood that in the early days it was about showing how much your culture was, you were cultured, you were buying high-quality wine. Um, and then... Uh, after that period, uh, the, the brand did well. It then focused on other bin numbers. You know, we all might remember, you know, the staples in Australia in the 70s, 80s were the, you know, bin 389, bin 28. Those wines started uh, going to China in a very, very big way. Um, and the message was, even though I don't believe a word of it, was that, you know, 389 aged in the same barrels as grain 12. That means absolutely nothing. And the production of Grange is tiny compared to that of 389, or it was. Um, but anyway, this story was told, this narrative was told, and 
people were, you know, oh, 389, and then 407 came in, 707, these other numbers. Very important that it came to the Chinese market. Uh, and Penfold's backed all this up with, with volume um, and uh, they understood, say, the education. And then what they also understood, very few uh, Australian companies really got their heads around was that the, the way that the Chinese tier their cities is actually a great indicator. It's almost telling you how to market. So Penfolds um, would be taken into the first tier cities and then second tier, and then third tier, fourth tier. And every time you took it into slightly lower tier or a new city, in Australia, we might think, oh, yeah, a city, what's that? Well, in China, they're the size of an Australian state. And these, these, um, these less cities, and uh, they were uneducated. And for them, all of a sudden, oh, yeah, they've heard about penfolds from their friends in Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, oh, it's Penfolds has arrived in our city, Ijo or something like this. Wow, let's go get it. And the big event would be there, the money would be spent, and it would be a pattern just repeating itself um, over the country. Uh, so those were the really good things that Penfolds did. Yeah, I'd love to talk about Penfolds because it really is a success story, so much so that whenever I've, I go to China, my partners in China always ask me to bring Penfolds wine with them, which is extraordinary. I, and I've said to them many times, there are lots of other brands in Australia. Would you like to try some other ones? They all say, no, 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 we want Penfolds. Mm -hmm. And of course, they use the Chinese name Binfu, which is uh, a big part of their success story as well. And I think it'd be interesting because I always use this as a great case study for any exporter about branding in China. Can you tell us how uh, Penfolds came up with this Binfu name and, and what, you know, what we can learn from that? Well, it was always, it's quite funny. I, I'd been to China probably five or six times before I eventually cottoned on what was happening and why it was going so well. And the and then I learned this, oh, yeah, you do realise that the, pen, the, the Chinese translation of the way the Chinese people say penfolds actually means running towards money. You know, Benfu, as you're saying. And, and that was just luck. But it's, it, it became, I mean, I guess imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And Penfolds for years have had legal teams all over China hosing down Chinese attempts to replicate that name and with counterfeit wine under Chinese binfu or English, mm. even in English. I mean, the, 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 as, as, we, as we know, <laughs> the Chinese are very creative when it comes to creating imitations. And the imitations that I've seen, which is probably only 10% of those that actually have existed, are astonishing in the, in the, in the use of that word. Um, but it is such a powerful thing. And, and the thing is, what I learned once, and it was a very, very successful Chinese businessman friend of mine, he said to me once, Jeremy, in China, 80% is 100%. If you're 80% sure of something, you're, that's actually as good as it gets. So that opens the door for this kind of counterfeit activity or, oh, yeah, I think that's penfolds, but I'm not quite sure. I was once in um, the most expensive um, Beijing duck restaurant in Beijing with a Chinese billionaire, and I asked him what wine he wanted to drink with the meal, and predictably enough, the, the answer was he liked 407. So I was taken very ceremoniously down to the wine cellar in this restaurant um, the most expensive street in Beijing, which his mother actually owned, um, and shown the cellar, and there were bottles of 407 there, and I picked them up. They looked okay for the first few seconds, and I couldn't tell why, but I was uneasy about them. They were a really good counterfeit. But we opened them up, and that, he knew they were fake. didn't matter. <laughs> It was like 80% to 100%. And so, um, you know, and this is a, this has been their, they're so successful over there. They've been copied so many times. And, and uh, I've even had companies saying, look, I'm the, I'm the official fake yeah. <laughs> of Penfolds. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's insane well, how big it was. And it's, yeah, and it's, it's remarkable that in a category like wine, an Australian wine, Penfolds dominates the top 10 
um, labels and brands in China. And, and it's extraordinary the success of that. Um, and it probably would have gone on forever, except for some of the sort of changes that have taken place since, and obviously some of their internal corporate wrangling. So what are the lessons that we can learn from the Penfold success story, both um, in terms of their success and perhaps some of the lessons of some of their failings as well? What, what can we learn from Penfolds? David, great question. I'm actually, forgive me, I'm just going to, I wrote this down. I wrote a little list of, a few minutes ago before we started. I think uh, if you look at the things that did really well, when they entered the market, their initial uh, quality to price ratio was fabulous. They were over delivering compared to what was around. The name, as we've, we've mentioned, so strong, so powerful, worth a fortune to the brand. The money they spent training the market, educating the market, and and then also focusing on the, um, the prestigious nature of their brand um, was incredible. The events they held all over the place, the money that was spent on that brand in China was astonishing. Um, and the other thing was the, the actual structure, the hierarchical structure, you had Graham sitting on top, but not quite. You had other occasional releases more expensive than Graham. David Deary said, okay, we'll... China's our market. We'll launch all these amazing things in China. We'll do our total global launch in China. So you understand and your audience will understand how important that was to the Chinese people to be recognised as such important consumers. And that emotional link and that show of faith in the market, I think, uh, really accelerated the, the penetration of the brand. And I think David Deary was the guy who, you know, has never really been given the credit for that. But um, the moment he was replaced by eventually Michael Clark, this is when the wheels started falling off because Clark's first decision uh, the effect that affected China in a big way was to take um, all the promotional money from all the, the Treasury wine estate brands and focus them on Penfolds. And the major market where the profit was being made was China. So this stripped brands that have since almost been forgotten, um, like Wins, um, uh, you know, Wolf Blass even, was huge. It was number two in China to Penfolds. It's, it's, it's a dead duck uh, anywhere, which is terribly sad. Um, so that was one thing. Then what was happening in the early days when I started going there, they, they already had a problem of parallel, parallel importing. So even in the heyday, um, and I know this because I had friends in ASC who were the distributor uh, for most of that period. Um, they was, and they had their own stickers on the bottles to show which were their wines, which were the bottles they bought into China. Even in the Penfolds heyday, about 40 to 45% of the Penfolds wine being sold in China was not through the official agency. So you had all these parallels coming in. This is a huge lesson for anyone looking in. At an ex, you know, what not to do in any export market. They had stuff even coming from the Barossa cellar door of Penfolds into China. They had stuff from Tha the Penfolds Thailand. Oh, we didn't meet budget this week. We'll sell some into China. Um, it was, it, and they were selling to private customers by the container load in China. So you had this total confusion, chaotic um, logistics operation going on their success was in spite of that and then eventually they said no we'll only you've got to go through us and by then it was too late because what they were then doing was and the Chinese are not stupid they were fully aware of this the price was going up like this and the Chinese could tell that the quality was not exactly keeping track with that possibly going the opposite way and it certainly has over the, over the duration has gone down. And in that time, uh, you know, 389 was one of the signature Australian wines. It was. You just had to have it. In the 1990s, it was compelling. It's not. So the quality's dropped. The price has gone up. And now you find, here's another salutary lesson for brand owners. You put all your eggs in one basket. That basket is taken away for you. And I would argue very strongly that was an own goal kicked by the Australian federal government, but that's another kettle, you know, kettle of whatever it is. We'll keep that away. But that happened. And then you see what's going on in Australia today, but all these wines that Penfolds have to sell 
uh, to, you know, to maintain the company's profitability. And what is going on at the moment now, uh, they're selling more direct, competing against their own retailers and, and distribution channels in Australia. Um, and they're going around paying growers at the moment, this vintage, uh, not to pick grapes. So it's, a, it's really um, a disaster if you look at it from that angle. And uh, one hopes that the Australian government and the Chinese government will be able to resume some kind of normality because, as you were pointing out before we went on air today, Australia is the only country that does not have you know, proper diplomatic dialogue with China. We need to mend that and restore what was once a $1.3 billion export industry of Australian wine into China because, and, and because that actually is, if you look at what happens when a country imports Australian wine, that brings tourism, that brings Chinese or brought Chinese visitors, that tourism propped up infrastructure and employment in rural Australia, as well as filled up our five-star hotels in our cities. Uh, it, bought, it bought students. It bought everything because of wine. And I remember even in the early days when I was in China, you know, 2004, 2005, sitting with Chinese kids and, and you know, when a kid's 25-year-olds, and, and they'd been to Australia. And I said, why did you go to Australia? Oh, we were sitting down. We, we tried a bottle of Australian wine. We liked it so much. We wanted to go and see the people who had made. We wanted to see where it came from. Typically intrepid Chinese. No idea about how to get around Australia. Just would turn up, at, uh, find the right place to get out, hire a car and go driving and see the place that had made that wine. We need to get back into that really desperately. Yes, um, and that's a, that's a very good point. Um, but I, I think we can agree that... Uh, if, if we had to name the top 10 brands that have been successful in China from Australia, Penfolds would be in there. I'd say um, in the top three. Yeah, exactly. And, no argument. And it's, it's a massive success story. I, mm. I've drunk, I've, I've probably drunk five or six bottles of Grange in my life, every time in China, never anywhere else. <laughs> and I, I know you've probably drunk a lot more. Um, and uh, I, I think there's no doubt that as a success story, Penfolds is right up there. It, it, it's, it's a massive success story. And I know that things have gone, not gone so well lately, but they can come back again. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you that the spin-off from that has been into tourism, possibly into education, um, and certainly into our, our export numbers. Um, any last uh, recommendations for future uh, aspiring brand owners, particularly in the wine industry, who are looking at China and wondering about the future? If they're looking at China, I think they've got to wait at least another three years. That's the intelligence I'm getting from my connections over there. Um, so after not this federal election, but the next federal election, I believe it's more likely that we'll be able to trade wine there again. But, you know, that three years goes pretty quickly. We've already had two years of this ban. It, it's astonishing. Um, I think when you go into China, um, it'll be a very different China. We don't yet know. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I'm, 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 you know, I've got friends here, Chinese friends here, and I'm learning. And they're saying, Jeremy, don't believe all you read. The market is still huge. Here are the stats. This is, for instance, the fashion industry growing in China. It's off the charts in terms of growth. Uh, China, China is open for business. And as you and you know as well as any human being, David, China's always adapting and making uh, the Chinese market will always find a solution in, to be able to operate in which conditions it's given. And Chinese people always find a way. They're very, very bright and very determined. And um, so when we do go back into China with wine, once again, it'll, I think we need to be very friendly, very welcoming, as we were before, tell our story. We tell our story in Australia better than uh, the people from any other country. We're very good um, at sharing what we have. We, we also want to learn about their culture, which I think also is a huge factor in Australian export success in China. Um, and, um, yeah, at, at a person-to-person -person level, um, those connections, let's hope they persist and they can reopen um, when the time eventually comes, which is beyond the control of either you or me, unfortunately. 
Yes. Well, having uh, had dinners with uh, senior government officials in China and enjoyed Australian wine with them, I'm certain that they'll be missing their, uh, their daily consumption of Australian wine, which, which is good for the future. So, uh, Jeremy, uh, you know, you, you, you've, thank you for sharing your experience in this area. It's been um, great to hear your sort of sweeping history of Australian wine and Penfolds in particular in China, which I think can go down as, as we said, one of the top three success stories uh, for Australia in China. So thank you for joining us and uh, good luck. And uh, let's hope we'll all be going back to China again soon. Looking forward to that, Dave. And thank you for, for today. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for joining us on the China Success podcast. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.